He's Canadian. He's American. His music includes folk, opera, indie pop, and even the songs of Judy Garland. Rufus Wainwright is a singer, songwriter, and composer whose talents shine almost irrespective of the genre hopping that's so intrinsic to his career. Appropriately then, perhaps, his newest offering is the album Unfollow the Rules, just released this summer. And it's a real pleasure to welcome Rufus Wainwright to our airwaves tonight from Austin, Texas. Rufus, it's great to see you. How are you doing? I'm doing good. I, uh, I'm here to do a, a rather well-known show called Austin City Limits, uh, which is exciting because it's pretty much the only gig <laughs> I'm doing uh, of late, although I have another one in Germany as well. Uh, but it's pretty, they're few and far between, and so it's just nice to be working. It's Good nice stuff. To be work. Good stuff. Let us, if we can, just play a little snippet of your latest work, and then we'll come back and chat, okay? Sheldon, the clip, if you would. Sometimes I feel like my heart turns to dust. Unfollow the rules, unswallow the trust. Sometimes I feel like my brain turns to leaves. Unfollow the rules, uncover the themes of the game. Can we start by your telling us how your daughter came up with the title of this album? Yeah. Um, well, I. Uh, oh, yeah. Uh, my husband and I and and Lorca, uh, the daughter, our daughter Viva's mother. We we have a wonderful girl named Viva, and she's nine years old. And uh, several uh, years ago, now I guess about two years ago, two or three years, she she just walked in one day and said, you know, Daddy. Sometimes I just want to unfollow the rules and, and then <laughs> proceeded to march out of the room. And, and I, instead of running after her and telling her that that wasn't such a great idea, I, of course, started writing down song lyrics uh, and focusing on that instead. So, so uh, and that became a song and, and then it became an album. So it's, uh, yeah, the, from the mouths of babes. Literally, the inspiration came to you for some lyrics immediately after she said that. Is that true? Yeah, yeah, no, it, it, I think what was great, what, what was interesting about that period uh, with Viva uh, was that she was in that amazing time when kids are, so, you know, they just hear words coming at them and they, and they put the, you know, they put these odd selections together that don't necessarily make sense off the bat, but, but once you really, you know, think about it, or it, it, it's, it's completely sensical. So I think she'd heard like unfollow from like, you know, Facebook or something and then rules from, you know, the way life is, and, and she just put them together. So, so yeah, no, I I uh, I I wrote started writing the song then. Perfect. Now I gather you went back to the studio where more than two decades ago you did your first album to do this one, and obviously that was a purposeful decision. So why did you make it? Yeah. Um, well, I you know I I live I, I, now I'm in Austin, Texas, but 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 we live in in Laurel Canyon in, in Los Angeles, Hollywood. Now and uh, 20 years ago. Uh, yeah, I made my first album there, and that was really the city. Los Angeles was really the city that uh, that propelled me further into my uh, musical career, and and uh, and gave me the you know the the strength to continue financially, <laughs> and uh, and 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 so 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 I've returned there uh, for several reasons, and and yes, this is definitely kind of a full circle. Uh, back to where it began, and it's you know it makes sense. It's, you know it's, I just celebrated the 20th anniversary of my first album, and um, and yeah, so it's I think you know life is about circles, and and we've completed one now. Well, you went outside the popular music circle not too long ago to do something that not too many rock and rollers or popular music singers or independent music singers do. You wrote two operas, yeah. Hadrian <laughs> and Prima Donna. Now, where, yeah. let's, let, let's dive into this a little bit here. Where did your interest yes. in opera come from in the first place? Yes, yes. well, my, um, I, you know, I grew up in Montreal, and uh, my mother and aunt, uh, Kate and Anna McGarrigal, they loved, they weren't such big opera fans, per se, but they adored tenors. Uh, and specifically, they adored the Swedish tenor, UC Bjurling, um, from the 40s and 50s. Anyways, but he, and one day they brought home a recording of UC Bjurling singing Verdi's Requiem, uh, with Leontine Price, a very famous recording, and and I was about thirteen, and I listened to that that whole two-hour-long piece, 
And by the end of it, I was completely hooked. It was it was an actual kind of religious experience hmm. with the mass, and and I just all I wanted to hear was opera. So that that stayed, and eventually uh, I felt like I needed to give back to that form. Uh, all the pleasure and 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 also pain <laughs> that it that it offered me. So uh, so I decided to write a couple of them. <laughs> I decided to write a couple of them. I wonder if there yeah. are people in well, your. I, 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 I want to write three because I don't I don't actually feel that I could be a proper opera composer unless I've written three. So. <laughs> well, that okay. That raises the question: When you tell, or when when people in the popular music world discover that you have written operas. I'm wondering how those conversations go. Do they, do they say strange things to you? They're very impressed. Uh, and, and, and it's kind of fascinating because, you know, when, when my first opera was uh, premiered, Prima Donna, this is o o over 10 years ago now. Um, but it, uh, you know, it, it, it uh, and, and just to say, they're doing a production of it this year in Sweden, in Stockholm at the Royal Opera House. So it's, it's it, the piece has done quite well. Anyways, but when, the, when it was first premiered, you know, the classical music, uh, critics were were pretty prickly with me. You know, I think they felt I was somewhat of a, a of a fraud or, or or an imposter or something, and they were pretty harsh on me. Where and whereas the pop critics were, I would even say overly uh, enthusiastic. For them, it just blew their mind that I would even attempt something so like that. So the gulf between both worlds is is pretty substantial. And are you getting any more acceptance in the serious, sober opera world yet? It seems so. I mean, as I said, they're doing Prima Donna has had seven productions, you know, uh, all over the world. So it's done well. And, and uh, there's a great recording of it, actually, on Deutsche Grammophon. And Hadrian, of course, was premiered at uh, uh, the, the COC uh, uh, last year, I think, uh, with, you know, an, a, a stellar cast. And, and there's other productions in mind. So it's really about getting produced again. That, that, that is the litmus, shall we say. Gotcha. I do want to talk a bit about how you manage to mix your political interests with your music, because not everybody likes to do that. Uh, I think it was Michael Jordan who famously said, you know, Republicans buy running shoes too, or Republicans buy sneakers too, which is why he didn't <laughs> want to do anything that might offend uh, anybody. However, um, yeah. Well, before the 2018 midterm elections in the U.S., you released Sword of Damocles, and here's a quote from around that. You said, Sword of Damocles is my artistic response to what I see currently transpiring within the American government and how its collapse is affecting every aspect of existence for us all. The famed ancient expression Sword of Damocles is a parable of impending doom of and to those in positions of power. This timeless tale points out the hard fact that with great power comes great responsibility and for all concerned, great danger. Vote. I'm curious as to why you don't worry about cutting off half your potential audience uh, uh, by being that blunt about your political preferences. Well, you know, it's funny because I, I never thought that I would um, have a, a, a sort of right wing audience ever, you know, because I was always very uh, liberal, shall we say, and, you know, and also being gay and out, you know, I, that, that kind of, you know, carved out other things. But, um, but anyways, but, but I, I do actually have people get up and leave my shows sometimes, you know, due to what I say. And, and there is, you know, I, 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 I do, you know, perform in the heartland of the United States and, and I've really come up against that, that whole situation. Um, and I don't know, I mean, it's, I, at this point, in terms of how terrible everything is in, in the United States uh, politically, I think it's just necessary for every citizen to do whatever they can, <laughs> in whatever capacity, <laughs> to uh, really, you know, get rid of the of, of, of Trump. I mean, it's and 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 the Republican Party, for that matter. It's it's. I think it's gone beyond a kind of like opinion thing. It's 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 it's, it's a state of emergency, and so it's so. Uh, yeah, what what would seem before like like maybe just sort of like a, I don't know, just an aspect of of my career is now actually I think just a fundamental uh, part of my humanity in terms of just surviving. <laughs> well, I mean, admittedly, this next story that I'm going to tell you happened when George W. Bush was president, not Donald Trump, yeah. but but you do know what happened to the then Dixie Chicks, now just the Chicks. Yeah when they said something uh, that a lot of people took offense at about the former president. I mean, they got blacklisted yeah. all over the place. You don't yeah. worry about that for yourself? Yeah. Well, no, I mean, I look, I was never, I, I've done very well over the years and I have a, a substantial fan base and, uh, and so forth. I've never been propelled into the, you know, this 
stratosphere of, of, of American superstardom like the Dixie, Dix, uh, like the chicks were. Um, but uh, but that being said, you know, maybe it's, maybe it's because I've always been very honest in general from the outset. I mean, I, I was always very vocal about how I felt about everything. Uh, uh, and that's something that I think that I actually inherited a lot from my parents, uh, who both both of them are singers, were, well, singer songwriters. And basically it needed to, um, you know, uh, just express themselves and be uh, honest uh, in general. That was what you did in the 60s and 70s. So I'm part of that tradition. I'm going to talk more about your folks in a bit if we can. But I, I, before we get there, I do want to talk about something that Elton John once said of you, which is a pretty sweet yeah. compliment from a pretty impressive guy. He once called you the greatest songwriter on the planet. How much has, <laughs> his, how much has he and his work influenced you? Well, I mean, uh, he hasn't taken it back yet, <laughs> so uh, I, I don't. I, he hasn't called anybody else the greatest singer-songwriter on the planet. So I, I perhaps, I perhaps I still am. Um, look, I, I, uh, I, I'm very uh, chuffed, as they say, that that he that he said that. And you know, it's funny because at the time when he did, I didn't take it that ser seriously in the sense like I know him, I know him pretty well, and I just thought it was sort of a very a really lovely thing for him to say. And and he's very, you know. Uh, la lavish in general, so so it was just I thought it just kind of came out, but b lo and behold, you know, ten years later, fifteen years later, it still sticks. That was a real title that he bestowed upon me, <laughs> and that I continue to, um, you know, really uh, get a lot of attention from. So so I'm very thankful to him, and I feel very honored, probably more now than I did when he, when he said it. Hmm. Now we know when he's talked about it, he, he and Bernie Taupin have a very particular songwriting process. They're in different rooms and, you know, one does one thing, the other does the other thing. Uh, how does it work for you? When you sit down to write a song, how does it actually work? Oh boy. I mean, I, I write all the time. I mean, I, I, I did a thing during COVID, uh, where, where we called the quarantunes where I would uh, do, sing a song every day from my our house in LA in, in my bathrobe. Uh, and uh, anyways, but that was basically just a, a glimpse into my daily um, routine, which is to get up and play piano in the morning. So I, I, I write all the time. Um, I would say that, you know, melodies come incredibly easily uh, and lyrics are very, very difficult. Um, and it's sort of balancing that, that Kind of um, dichotomy that 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 uh, I don't know that, that that interests me. I mean, I mean, I I I uh, and I think actually with lyrics and and this is, brings me back to unfollow the rules. I'm very happy with the lyrics on unfollow the rules. I worked very hard on those and and uh, and I act, and I do actually feel that the lyric writing in general is is somewhat under threat <laughs> if you listen to some of the stuff out there. <laughs> Have you discovered in yourself why you find the tune comes so much more easily than the lyrics? Uh, I haven't. I, I, I do. I do feel it's just a natural uh, a function from having been brought up in a, in a very musical family where there was just music all the time, and uh, you know my mother, our mother Kate, sang to us uh, a lot and, and 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 sang also to herself, and it was just music was always just everywhere growing up. Well, I think it would be wrong of us if we did not play a little of your mother's work on this because she has been so influential. Here is she, Kate McGarrigal, and your sister Martha, hard at work. Roll it, please, Sheldon. Talk to me of Mendocino, closing my eyes, I hear the sea. You know, I, I mean, that is so heavenly. I mean, that's that's like angel singing. Would you agree? <laughs> I, I I would. I mean, <laughs> I, 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 of course, hear a few devils here and there. <laughs> uh, but, but, but on the whole, it's it's angelic. And, and there was, I mean, look, I mean, when, especially the McGarrigal sisters, when they burst on the scene uh, many years ago, it was, it was pretty, I don't know, it was quite disarming, the harmonies that they, that they, fashioned and people were really stunned by by the beauty of their them singing together as a family and so we, so we we've continued that tradition I uh, you know I, I don't mean to get too overly heavy with you here however you know your mother died very young right she's only yeah. 63 years old it's 10 years ago already 
Yeah. And I wonder how often you say to yourself, damn it all, I so wish she was around just to see, yeah. you know, this latest song that I've written or this, you know, yeah. this daughter that I now have or all of that stuff. Yeah, yeah. yeah no, it, no it, it haunts me. And I have to say, I was, at about five years, I was, I was convinced that 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 uh, I was over it. You know, I I really felt like I'd gone through all the various, you know, stages of grief, and I'd come out the other end, and you know, had to continue my life. And and it was okay for about five years, but then re just recently, about in, for the tenth anniversary, it kind of came back with a real wallop. And uh, and and you know, and maybe it was the fact that you know so much has happened in the last. Uh, ten years in terms of having a child and 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 just the way the world is today, and also a lot of the wonderful things that I, I've been able to be a part of. so so yeah, it it, it uh, I think I think as you get older, it kind of goes away, but then it hits you way harder <laughs> at certain moments that it's like it's uh, somewhat relentless, actually. Hmm. Now, there is an irony here in as much as you clearly have this incredible connection with your mother, and yet yes. it's it's your father's last name that you carry. Yeah, and yeah. and I do remember Loudon Wainwright the third very much as a kid growing up, yeah. and I know all about that dead skunk in the middle of the road and all that business. Yeah. But yeah. you did a song once upon a time, dinner at eight, which is a pretty raw account of your relationship with your dad. And if yeah. I'm not uh, treading on difficult ground here, can I ask how things are with him now? Yeah, no, no it's it, it, it's fair game. I mean, my dad and I are doing really well right now. Um, but we certainly had our periods, uh, our rough patches. Um, and I, I would say, you know, in a lot of ways, I think my, my relationship to my father is quite common, actually, uh, uh, in terms of boys and their dads, and just where at a certain point, both parties have to just accept <laughs> who the other one is and get what they can and, you know, use the time wisely that is left and, and just not sort of expect so much. Um, from from uh, from each other and and therefore just and, and just you know be at peace. So and so so we've gotten to that point now in our life, and we love each other very very much. Um, and uh, but we also realize that you know we're we're different people and and also different people than we imagine the other one to be. So it's it's a long process, but it's 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 we we we've, we've made it in a lot of ways. And do you think he he now accepts everything about who you are? You know, I, I think so. I mean, we can still, we still have the ability, it's just sort of built in to, to really, you know, I, I don't know, uh, to take each other down if, if need be, you know. Um, I think there's still a lot of things that will annoy him and, and vice versa. But I don't know, it's sort of, I don't know, we were able to identify it and, 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 uh, and, and, and talk through it and stuff. We're very, I mean, my father is, a, he's a fascinating man and he's a brilliant artist, he's a great singer uh, and singing now better than he's ever sung. Hmm. And he just, he just doesn't want to, he, he just, he just, we, we both just want to be the star of the show. So it's, <laughs> it's just one of those things a little bit. I get you. I get you. <laughs> uh, given who, I, I know you've been asked this question a million times, but I've never asked it and I'm curious about it. You know, given who your parents are, was there any doubt but that you'd end up in the line of work you're in? Uh, not really. I mean, I, I, I like to tell everybody that, you know, there are these amazing uh, 70s Polaroids, uh, faded Polaroids, it's such a thing now, but uh, th th that I can, you know, locate and, and just there's so many of me as a baby just reaching towards the piano, hanging by the piano, in my diaper, at the piano. <laughs> and uh, so I was just so um, drawn to that instrument and uh, and was singing all the time. So I think it was it was it was uh, pretty obvious, uh, thankfully, that that was what I was going to do. I think one of the funniest stories I heard about you, and this is when I was watching the video, is that while most Canadians grew up on Joni Mitchell's music, you were prohibited yeah. from listening to it for yeah. the longest time. What's the story there? Yeah, no, I mean, I, I love Joni Mitchell's music, and I also love her as, as a person. You know, she's actually a good friend of ours. Uh, but but when I was growing up uh, in in Canada in Montreal, my mother, who you know is a is a great uh, uh, singer songwriter in her own right, um, really harbored a, a resentment towards Joni, as as do a lot of people. Um, and I think for my mother, it was it was twofold. It was it was on one hand, it was um, I think you know my mother was a bit of a purist, 
a folk music purist and felt like her her music was somewhat of a of a of a of a you know uh, of a whatever pop thing uh, it was kind of trashy and uh, but then also I think the real the reality of it I think was that my mother was also very jealous of, of Joni and of her success and her financial you know uh, rewards and stuff so uh, so yeah it was it was. I think one was sort of a, a good opinion and the other one was just human frailty. <laughs> <laughs> Rufus, there's another quote of yours that I want to put to you because I, it, it's so delicious and I got to find out more about what you meant. Writing music is my greatest joy and a complete disease. It never stops aggravating me and there are times when if I can't get a song out, I have physical aches and pains. Yeah, can you yeah. tell? Can you talk a little more about that? How, how you see this not only as something that brings you such joy, yeah. but as a yeah. disease. Yeah. Well, it's interesting. I mean, I, I have uh, a situation right now. I mean, this is get your tissues out. But, you know, we had a wonderful puppy uh, named Puccini uh, that, that we had over the summer who was a miniature uh, Australian shepherd. Anyways, and sadly, he was he, he died over the summer uh, quite violently uh, in a fight with another dog. Anyways, um, so I started writing a song about it, thinking, you know, it would just be like a cute song about about a, a little puppy that's gone. And then of course, now the song is turning into, you know, this reflection of the apocalypse. Um, and it is this, and it's incredibly emotional and it's incredibly hard, but I ha kind of have to go there. And um, yeah, it's, uh, it's tough, but it's, I don't know. It's just my calling, I suppose, you know? And when the song just doesn't want to come out, what do you yeah. do to make sure it does? Uh, well, you, uh, well, it's not, I, I don't have so much of a problem of it not wanting to come out. It's like, sometimes it, it's coming out and I don't necessarily want it to come out because it's too emotional. Ah. Um, so it's, uh, I just sort of ride the wave. <laughs> <laughs> well, that takes me to my, my last question for you. And, um, and it's this, I'm not bilingual by any stretch of the imagination, but, uh, est-ce que vous voulez chanter en français quelques jours? Oh oui, j'aimerais ça faire un, 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 tout un album en français, oui. Oui, oui. My, you know, my mother and aunt, Kate McGarrick's sister, made some of the best French records uh, of the 70s um, and 80s. And uh, so, so I would like to continue that tr tradition and, and make a French record big time. Cool. We look forward to talking to you again when that happens, because that would be exciting. Yes, it would, be. it would be. Rufus, I can't tell you how uh, fabulous it's been for you to have spent so much time with us here on TVO. Best of luck with Unfollow the Rules and uh, stay safe during this pandemic, okay? Thank you so much. And it's great to be on the show. I've been a fan for years, so, so it's great for me too. You're very kind. Thank you. Okay. The Agenda with Steve Pakin is brought to you by the Chartered Professional Accountants of Ontario. CPA Ontario is a regulator, an educator, a thought leader, and an advocate. We protect the public. We advance our profession. We guide our CPAs. We are CPA Ontario. And by viewers like you. Thank you.